Hello everyone, welcome. This is Steve Suffoletto from Erie Community College. Today's presentation is on inks, specifically litho inks. Inks have to have certain functionalities. They must be able to transfer on the rollers. We don't want the inks to, to over emulsify, lose their tack, and start to pile and cake. The inks have to dry. They have to change their form from a wet paste to a dry solid. And inks have to adhere. They have to stick and not readily scratch or rub off the substrate. The obvious exception here would be lottery tickets and their scratch-off coatings. There are two different ink types. The first one is fluid. Here the viscosity is very low, so it acts like a liquid, and you can pour it out of its container. Because it's a liquid, it can't transfer using soft rubber rollers. It would just drip right off. Gravure, flexography, using an analox, and inkjet, using a spray nozzle, would all be liquid inks. Paste inks are high in viscosity. Tack is a better term, the stickiness of the ink. Transfer needs several, many rollers, and that's called the roller train. Offset lithography, screen printing, and letterpress would be examples of paste inks. Printing inks are specifically formulated considering the following factors the type of printing process, whether it be lithography, gravure, flexography, and maybe even the press design, if it's a perfecting press. So you might have a top side black and a bottom side perfecting black. The drying method, and we'll discuss that in detail. Paper substrates, whether it's on gloss coated, uncoated paper, ground wood, or perhaps a, a synthetic plastic film. And then the end use requirements. Does it have to resist some type of a chemical resistance to light called light fastness or being fugitive? There are basically two ingredients to an ink. Pigment, which gives it the color. Without pigment, the ink would be colorless. It would be clear, so it would be a varnish or it would be a transparent white. Pigments are made out of solid particles. And about 20% of the ink is pigments by its weight. And the more pigment you put into the ink, the stronger the ink is, and the more mileage or length you'll get out of it. The other ingredient is the vehicle. Since the pigments are solids, they cannot be dissolved, so they have to be carried or suspended. The vehicle determines many of the physical and functional properties of the ink. And as we mentioned earlier, ink must be functional. It has to transfer, it has to dry, and it has to adhere. A special type of ink is called soy ink. A vehicle has traditionally been a petroleum distillate, an oil base. These contain VOCs or volatile organic compounds. So to be more environmentally friendly and renewable resource, we can use a vegetable or a plant oil. An example would be a soybean. Soy inks typically dry slower, but this would not be an issue if you're doing an inline aqueous or water-based coating. And to be classified as a soy ink, 18% of the ink's weight has to be using soy. Now, lithography works on the principle that oil and water don't readily, I have that underlined and in quotes, mix. We do want some mixing so that we can form this emulsion. The roller train actually assists us in mixing the fountain solution with the ink to make that emulsion. Now, the emulsion should be mostly ink, the majority, mixed with some water, the minority. So as long as the balance is mostly ink with some water, that's fine. But if you over emulsify, then you will flip flop and reverse that relationship so that now it's an opposite relationship. Now that would be mostly water with some ink. And since water gets applied everywhere, the ink also gets applied everywhere. And now you have a technical problem called tinting or toning, not to be confused with catch up, dry up, or scumming all unfortunately have the same symptom, which is the background or the non of the plate is printing dirty. Let's talk about chemical mixtures. You can have a solution. A solution, you completely dissolve something into another so it's clear it has no light scattering properties. A typical example would be a dye. So for an example, if you took salt or sugar and stirred it in water, it would completely dissolve and be colorless, clear. You can have an emulsion, the technical name here would be a colloid. It's a temporary mixture, but it will eventually separate out. 
So mayonnaise, Italian salad dressing, using oil and vinegar would be a good example. A suspension would be a pigment where you have to disperse it into a medium. Now, toner is an interesting conversation. Pigments are solids. Dyes can be dissolved. So how is a toner different? Well, a toner is a pigment, but it needs to be electrically charged. So if it can hold a static electrical charge, that pigment would now be called a toner used in electrophotography, EP, or laser printers. There are several ways that you can dry an ink. One method is by absorption. This would be used by cold set web presses that print newspapers, SNAP specifications for newsprint advertising publications. So here you need to have a very absorbent paper, obviously uncoated, perhaps better, a newsprint groundwood pulp. Evaporation, this would be used on heat set web presses, printing magazines, this would be swap specifications web offset publication. It's basically a solvent based ink, so you need a long hot dryer oven to flash off or evaporate off the solvents. A third method would be oxidation polymerization. This would be used for sheet fed offset lithography, Graco, general requirements for the applications of commercial offset lithography. You need air, you need oxygen for oxidation to occur. There's a type of oxidation ink called Quickset, which is a little bit of solvent in it that sets the ink up quickly, but it's still mostly an oil-based ink. And then finally, you have radiation cured inks, uh, UV for ultraviolet and EB for electron beam. The big advantage of radiation UV inks are they instantly cure to a solid. So the three stages of an ink drying are wet, set, and dry. We can take a look at the top surface and the bottom surface of the ink. On a wet ink, both the top and bottom are wet. Therefore, if you take your index finger and drag it through the ink, the ink being wet is going to smear. Ink is typically wet for about the first minute or so. Then the next step is setting, where the top surface is dry, but the bottom surface is still wet. So if you take your index finger and drag it through, it won't smear. But if you take your thumb and you twist your thumb, the thumb will rub the ink. Setting occurs within the first 15 minutes or so. And then you have drying, where both the top and the bottom surface is dry. So nothing's going to make that ink move, the index finger or the thumb rubbing. This will typically take somewhere between two to three hours for an ink to dry. So drying like a, of an ink is similar to an oil-based paint or a latex paint. So if we had a graph here of tack, less tacky, sticky, more tacky, sticky over time, uh, when an ink is wet, again, when you drag your finger through the ink, it's going to smear. When the ink is set, its tack is increasing. If you take your index finger through the ink, it won't smear. But if you take your thumb and rub it, it will, it will smear. And then all of a sudden the ink suddenly drops to no tack. That means the ink is technically dry. So three minutes for setting, three hours for drying, question mark. Uh, the three seconds and three minutes apply to inks that have been aqueous coated. Setting versus drying. So after setting, the press sheet can be gently handled. You can repile it, you can wind it, you can air it, and you can turn it over without the ink smearing. Only after fully drying can a sheet be second pass backed up or sent to post press operations for machine cutting and folding. Now on the Ryobi 2800s, we don't have a spray powder in a delivery. So running multiple colors on different presses during the same lab may result in the ink smearing and marking, especially from the rubber infeed rollers. To avoid set off, don't handle or move the delivery load use anti-set-off spray powder, and if possible, use an inline aqueous water-based coating. Dry skin must be removed so it doesn't cause print quality defects like voids and holes. We call these fish eyes. We call these hickeys, fish eyes, and donuts. You don't want to dig a deep hole into the can. It's very wasteful. So this illustration here is a hickey. This particle here is large tall in height and it's hard, rigid. So what happens is it depresses the blanket around it so it can't transfer to the plate or to the paper, leaving you a void or a hole, looking like a fisheye. 
So these are examples of skin on the can. That's dry ink there. You have to slice around the outer edge and then peel this off so you don't get any hickeys. And to help us prevent this from getting a skin, you can take this aerosol can of anti-skin and spray it onto the can. Ink colors. There's basically two types of ink colors. We have process or process color inks. The hues are cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Please don't call cyan blue, and please don't call magenta red. Process color inks must be transparent. They cannot be opaque because you want to be able to mix them on the paper. So obviously, the combination of cyan magenta would give you the blue that looks like a purple violet. The combination magenta yellow gives you a red that might look like an orange. And the combination cyan yellow would give you the green. Now, black or K is typically the key line. It's a line rule or border that prints in black to help hide misregistration. And of course, if you want to, you can use process colors to simulate a spot color. We call that calling it out or building it, synthesizing it. You might also refer to it as a bridge. Spot colors, these are solid colors typically, but they can also be screen tint, vignettes, blends. Some people call these special colors, match colors, fountain colors, brand colors, logo colors, corporate colors, Pantone, PMS, or accent colors. Here, the color is by itself in the can. And here's a PowerPoint slide that also has a YouTube video. The slide here is a little bit more advanced. Pantone's a famous default industry standard. Uh, Pantone is owned by X-Rate. So the formula fan guide will show you the Pantone number and its recipe or its formulation. These books typically cost about $150. They have separate books for the coded C and the uncoded U versions. So it's the same number, the same formula and recipe, just printed on different papers. And because different papers will print the inks differently, you get different colors. So Pantone would be an example of a color space that is dependent, color dependent, device dependent on the paper. They do have special books for the pastel colors, the neons, and the metallics. The most famous edition of Pantone is probably called the Plus Edition. You have 14 base or basic mixing colors, colorants, and from those you can get over 2,000 colors. Now, how many colors is enough? Well, every year Pantone introduces another dozen or so colors. Rheology is the science or the measurement of flow, how a material flows. So ink consistency can be described as being length. It's either a long ink or it's a short ink. Think about trolling that ink knife because you get the long strings dripping off the knife. Body is another term we use. The body can be loose or thin or stiff or thick. So if you take an ink knife and put it into the can of ink, does that ink knife stand up straight, which would be a stiff, thick ink, or does it fall over in the can, which would be a loose, thin ink? And the third definition or characteristic would be called tack, which is stickiness. And the technical definition for tack is the force required to split the ink apart. So every time you split an ink, trying to transfer it, you have a tack force required to do that. Tack will affect your wet trapping. So on the Ryobi 3302s, which are two color presses that use a common or central impression cylinder, wet trapping is important. So as you go from feeder to delivery, from unit one to unit two, you want the ink tax to go from high to low so that the ink on the paper pulls the ink on the blanket off. If it was the other way, the ink on the blanket being stickier would pull the wet ink off the paper up onto the blanket, therefore onto the plate, therefore into the rollers, and you would slowly and gradually start to contaminate that color. So that's why we typically want to run lighter colors first and darker colors last so that we don't have back trapping wet contamination. And process versus spot colors. In our lab, the process color inks seem to be a little shorter and stiffer. They have better water pickup, they have less emulsification, and they give us better ink water balance. However, when we go to some of the spot colors in our lab, the inks are a little looser, they're a little longer. We have less water pickup. They start to emulsify quicker, and we may have some ink water balance challenges that lead up to uh, catch up and dry up. Ink is purchased and bought by weight, pounds typically, 
but it's consumed and used by volume, the number of square inches it will cover. Now the price will depend on the volume. At Erie Community College, I think we're spending $12 for black, $16 for cyan and yellow, and $19 for magenta. But when I was working at the Buffalo News Direct, the sheet bed division, we were paying about $4 a pound for our process color inks. Compared to other raw materials like paper and blankets and rollers, other supplies, ink is relatively inexpensive. It's only about 5% of the cost of a job. Now the pigment concentration, whether you have a lot of pigment in there or a little pigment in there, is the strength, whether it's strong or weak. We often call that loading. It determines the ink mileage. Think of ink mileage as like a miles per gallon or MPG on an automobile, a car. So the stronger the ink is, the more mileage you will have. Here's a list of some ink companies, Sun, Flint, and INX. Those are the three big ones. Then you have Hosman, Steinberg, Wyckoff, Toyo, Nasdar, Van Sun, Superior, and Cola Madden. Let's look at Braden Suffin because that's the ink that we use in the lab. It's a small family owned business out of Cleveland, Ohio. And in 2018, Wyckoff purchased them. The ink that we're using in the lab is called PDI for Premium Duplicator Ink. It's a rubber-based ink, meaning that the ink stays open and it doesn't skin quickly. So on the rollers, the ink should stay open for about two shifts overnight. So you shouldn't really have to wash up, but you probably do have to spray no skin on the rollers. In the can, it should be open for two days, and in a closed can, it should stay open for about two weeks. They also have another ink called Ultra. It's a fast-drying ink for work and turns, and we use this for our Pantone mixing bases, which is why you'll notice that those inks will crust up and form a skin very quickly. Here's some additional resources. There's a magazine called Ink World Magazine. And there's a trade association called the National Association for Print Ink Manufacturers, or NAPIM. If you go to Print Wiki, there's a chapter on ink. And there's a very professionally made YouTube video about how ink was made out of a company in Canada. I encourage you to visit these websites at your leisure. In summary, ink is an important raw material that we use in printing. Ink has several properties. Optical properties would be things like its color, the transparency, the gloss. Physical properties would be tack, ink film thickness, IFT. And functional properties would be things like how the ink transfers on the rollers, how it dries, and how it adheres. The ink has to have good runnability on press and good printability on press. Lithol inks need to resist the acidic fountain solution and not over emulsify and get waterlogged. Well, thank you. I appreciate your attendance and participation. Hopefully you found this interesting, informative, and relevant. And please provide feedback for continuous improvement. Until we meet again, have a good day.